Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of joining you all as your moderator this evening as we explore the glorious city of Siena, along with Rick and a very special guest tonight. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our one of our tour guides this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Gabe, thank you so much, and buongiorno, everybody. Buongiorno tutti. I'm going to be learning a little bit of Italian this evening because we've got with us a wonderful local guide, Anna Piperato, who's going to be joining us. And I just want to thank all of you for dropping in on this Monday night. This is kind of a tradition, I think, for the last year when we are dreaming of our travels and we've been living through this pandemic. It can be frustrating, but we have one place to come where we can be together with other travelers and enthuse about our love of hitting the road. And you know, my beat is Europe. And every week we go somewhere else in Europe generally, and we celebrate all the wonders that Europe has to offer. So I hope you're ready for a nice evening. I hope you've got your favorite travel partner with you, something nice and culturally appropriate to uh, wet your whistle and some food, maybe relating to Italy or Tuscany. And I hope you're ready for some good traveling. I just love Mondays because I cut off work a little early. I tidy up the house. It's, I feel like I've got company coming over and it's just so great to host all of you this evening as we go to Siena. I wanna to introduce to you our guide, but first I wanna take you to Siena and show you just a couple of clips that I've enjoyed with my time with Anna. I will remind you, during these clips, it's just a quick little spontaneous ad lib face, uh, you know, Facebook post. And uh, in this case, my mic was right here. So you're gonna hear me and Anna's a little soft, but listen carefully, you can hear Anna. And as you hear Anna here, think about the value of having a local guide. I mean, you know, my advantage is I've got friends who are local guides. Anybody can have local guides when you go around Europe. You just book them, they meet you, and they open up all sorts of wonders that you might not otherwise appreciate. One of the great things about Italy is enjoying the sense of community on the main square, the piazza. Right now, let's go to the piazza, probably one of the most beloved piazzas anywhere in Europe, Il Campo, with the help of Anna, who we're gonna meet in just a moment. Again, Anna's voice is a little soft because I failed to mic her up. She's talking on my mic. Buonasera, I'm in beautiful Siena and I'm with Anna Piperato. Anna. Oh, buonasera. Now, Anna, you grew up in Massachusetts, I did, I but did. now you live in Siena. I live in Siena. And we've been, Anna's a guide here and she's been helping me with restaurants. Mm -hmm. And uh, we both came to Il Campo and Oh, we've both been coming here for years, and you know, you came here so much you moved in. Exactly. <laughs> but you come here and you just go, ah, I mean, look at that. And when you look at Il Campo, and we look at that bell tower, what does it mean to a Sienese? What, what does it mean? This is home. I mean, the Sienese, you've heard of the term campanilismo, right? The bell tower syndrome that your town within the sound of the bells is the most beautiful and these bells are the most beautiful because this is the most beautiful town and every Sienese feels that this is a symbol of their city. This is the center, this is the heart, this is home. Wow, mm -hmm. spoken from, from the heart by an American who's adopted <laughs> Siena as her home and I love this idea of campanilismo. Italy is called the, the land of a thousand bell towers or something like that and everybody, when they hear the sound of their bell tower, their heart pumps a little happier and a little faster. And I think that's probably more true here in Siena than in most towns. Uh, it's just so good to be here. I love Siena. I love Il Campo. And I love connecting with this culture. Anna, grazie. Ciao. And I'm not the only one who loves Siena. If you've been to Siena, you love Siena. That just seems like that. In my office, we have a, a running joke. Whenever anybody mentions Siena, somebody kind of moans as if they're in great ecstasy. Oh, Siena, I love Siena. It's just almost a caricature of travel happiness, Siena. And we, when we look at that bell tower there, that campanile, campanile, it's like, an, I see it as an expression mark. It says, we are proud, we are independent, we are Siena, and there are statue, there are campaniles, there are bell towers all over Europe that are exclamation marks for the pride of that community. Now, go with me and Anna inside the city hall and we'll learn a little bit about the art that's in there. Oh, 
Hi, I'm Rick Steves. I'm in Siena's City Hall, and I'm with a wonderful local guide, Anna Piperato. Anna, ciao. And Anna's been teaching me all about the, uh, the uniqueness of Siena's government. And Anna, when we look at this hall, really, what's the context of this hall? What happened here? This was the meeting room for the General Council of Siena, and next door, the government of the Nine met, and they were always reminded to rule justly and to be guided by wisdom. And if we look up here, what is Mary and Jesus, what are they holding in this, in this mass? Is it called a maesta? What are, Mary a ma and maesta, the virgin and child enthroned, and the Christ child is holding a scroll that says, Love justice, you who rule the earth. A constant reminder to the leaders of the city to rule with wisdom, as we said. And if Christ says it, you better listen. Love justice. You who rule the earth. Oh my God, there's so much that we can pay attention to yeah. in 2019. And this, this is a message from... The 1300s. Yes, 1315. What, 600, 700 years ago? I can do that. So these guys were figuring it out, yeah. and we can too. <laughs> we're inspired by the story of Siena. Happy travels. Whoa. Love justice, those who rule the earth. And there are some stories of American politicians from different parts of the political spectrum who have gone to this hallowed spot. Some have enjoyed it, and some have not. Hey, I want to introduce right now my good friend, Anna from Siena. Anna, thanks for joining us. Buonasera, Rick. Buonasera a tutti. <laughs> ah, buonasera. And I love when I'm with you that we, um, I was going to say we learn the language, but we also know how to drink as Brits. But we, you have such a love of the language and you have such a, I love the way you have proven that an American can adopt an Italian culture and make it her home. Yes. <laughs> I, I moved here, I guess, about well, seven years ago, but Siena has been a part of my life for much longer than that. Maybe it was my destiny, because the first time I ever slept here, it was literally up the road, because those of you who've been to Siena know it's all hills. So I live here, and at the top of the road, to the left, is a hotel, and that is where I slept my first time in Siena, and this is where I live. Now you live, and have, would you say after how many years have you been there? Seven, seven. Seven years. Are you part of the community? Do people, I, I would imagine you're always the, the American girl, but you're part, of, you're part of that contrada. Yes, exactly. So I, I found myself in the Lupa, La Contrada de la Lupa, which is the district of the she the best one. And quite by accident, did I find myself in one of these 17 neighborhoods of Siena. And uh, it really, sometimes when you go somewhere without a plan, that that's when your life changes and you just go with an open heart and an open mind and maybe a few of these yeah. and, uh... <laughs> and, and, and some and some historical and cultural background didn't I, I understand you have a um, upper degree in St. Catherine or something like that what is your yeah. connection with St. Catherine who is the I think the patron saint or the the hometown girl there She's definitely a hometown girl. Again, I, I never would have thought that I, I wanted to do my thesis on 14th century saints in 14th and 15th century art. And I had a whole bunch of saints and I ended up with one in the 16th century and her name was St. Catherine. And she is surprisingly not the patron saint of Siena, but certainly a, a local girl, um, but she is the patron saint of Italy and Europe and the first female doctor of the church. So she's kind of a big deal. And she's from, again, just up the road from four or 500 years ago. And uh, I, I just, anybody who's excited about the Middle Ages and anybody who's excited about the, the history and the history of the church and so on, I think it gives you a huge advantage in celebrating the local culture. And we're gonna do a lot of that, but right now, let's talk a little bit about what we're eating and drinking because you just ah, uh, held up a drink there. I and did. Let's do our drink first here because I'm a little thirsty. <laughs> Tell us about an Aperol spritz because this color reminds me of Italy in the piazza after a long day of work, everybody is there with their drink and the, the sun is shining through it. Even the light is shining through this right now and it just glows like a lantern of happiness. A lantern of happiness, I like that. First of all, cheers, chin chin, chin, chin. salute. Yeah. yeah, a bit of liquor courage is good. Uh, the, the culture of eating and drinking, as you know, in Italy is very important, but you have to eat and drink things in a certain order. Okay. So you have to have your aperitivo before mm. dinner to get you ready to get rid of the day and get ready to eat. So this so is perfect. This strokes your appetite and it's quite easy to make. You've got about 50% Aperol and 50% Prosecco and a splash of soda water and a, and a slice of uh, orange. It's that simple, isn't it? 
Exactly. And some ice. Italians and aren't big on ice, but they will accept it in a spritz. <laughs> okay. And then you, I, I, I was reading, you have to have some potato chips, believe it or not, with your spritz when you are ordering it in a bar. I forgot to get potato chips. I've got more than enough because I don't eat a lot of potato <laughs> chips and I got these just for tonight. I wish I could send them over to you. Oh. Well, I have something better. I have a well, regular you know, bruschetta with just tomatoes and obviously local olive oil from, again, just a few miles down the road. This was handpicked by my friend Dario in November. Uh, so my, my lovely olive oil on the tomatoes. And then I have, do you know what this is? Mm, I won't tell you what it looks like to me, but no, I, I, what is that? That's some kind of liver paste. Yes, it's crostino nero, and it's it is liver paste, chicken livers, maybe a bit of spleen in there, maybe some anchovies. Mm. Oh, it's talk absolutely dirty to me. delicious. Yeah, nice. And my plate, it's quite. Oh, I mean. be careful! And, and you know, there's a good example right there: spleen and liver. A lot of people go, "Oh no, thank you. This is it. You got to try it." Now I've got my bruschetta, and I just love a bruschetta. And mm. this is my dinner. It's all I can do to have not eaten my, my uh, props. So I wanted to show these quick. You're already into your props. First of all, I want to give people just a quick lesson. And you correct me if I'm, if I'm off base here. You take your rustic bread and you toast it. And then you scrape a, a raw garlic clove on it. And you drizzle it with olive oil. And you sprinkle it with some good sea salt. And there's your classic right there. And, I, 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 and then you can decorate it with the Italian flag, if you like, red, white, and green. And that, and that would be tomato, mozzarella, and some basil uh, on top of the, the classic. Or there's, it's like an omelet or a pizza. You can put whatever you like on it. I, have, I love anchovies. A chuge. You got to try a chuge. Chuge. Sono buonissime. So I just made this one up, but it's got my basic olive oil and, and garlic with some two cubed up tomatoes. And then a, a nice, uh, lovely, limpid anchovy draped over my bruschetta. Bravissimo. I would say that looks very appetizing indeed. <laughs> so that's my bruschetta, and I have complemented it with another Italian flag, and this mm. is the insalata caprese. In English, the Capri Island salad, right? Well, a little bit further south than where we are, but it works. It works, it works. everywhere. And here we have our mozzarella, our tomato, and our um, beautiful basil. One thing I really like when you were introducing yours is your friend picked the olives just a couple of months ago. Is that right? I mean, yes. How many how many people can say that? And it just adds a little cultural and personal terroir to the festival, doesn't it? So good. And so, that's why you have to have your plain bruschetta with just your bread, saltless bread, and the olive oil so you can appreciate the olive oil. Yes. <laughs> now we're going to go to just, I had this little random clip here, but we were filming and we dropped in on an old folks home, a senior center. And the little children were visiting and dancing for the great grandmas. And I just, I was really touched by that because I thought I would imagine a lot of people think, well, that happens in my community, but does it really happen overseas? And obviously it happens everywhere. Let's go to a senior center and see how the kids are bringing a little joy to the grannies. Hi, I'm Rick Steves and I'm in Siena. And of course, we all go to Siena to see the tourist uh, attractions and the great art and just the wonderful dimension of Tuscany. But it's Easter time and it's just a great reminder that all over the world, there are old folks homes where the kids are coming together to, to show a little love to the seniors. And uh, here in Italy, like just all over the United States, we've got an Easter celebration where people who are starting out their lives are bringing some joy to people who are just finishing their lives. I just love that. Does that is, isn't that a beautiful part of, of traveling, Anna? It is. And, and 
I think you find this in, in many communities, but there isn't just, you know, the, the kids are over here and the elderly are over there. Everyone is all mixed together. Mm. Um, and that adds to that sense of community that you mentioned at the beginning. And that's felt very strongly here. You know, I so, think that's interesting because that's becoming trendy now in the United States is when you, when you build a senior center, it's not going to be called a senior center because you don't want to imply your parking the seniors over here. You don't want to silo people away. And Europe is a great example of a multi-generational festival of life where people are definitely in community. Now, in order to be in community, you've got to communicate, you've got to speak. And in Italy, you've got to know how to order a cup of coffee. I really enjoy the work that you and your friend Umber do. So I wanted to show a little four minute lesson here on coffee. We're going to roll this. This is by uh, Anna and you have a link in the chat section or in the, in the chat section here to um, connect with uh, Anna and her website where she's got a number of these teaching videos. You're gonna learn about the art of coffee here as a tourist ordering smartly, but you're also gonna hear two people and, and, a, and an American who's adopted Italy and an Italian uh, teach by example, the language. So check this out and uh, it can really make a difference in your travels. Hello, my name is Anna. Ciao, mi chiamo Ambra. Oh, ciao Ambra. Ciao, Anna. Welcome back to another edition of Essential Italiano. Today, we're going to learn a very important lesson, how to order this or this at the bar. Ambra, is it true that in Italy, everyone goes to the bar every day? Sì, è vero. When we say going to the bar, we don't just mean going to the bar, do we? No, per noi andare al bar vuol dire prima di tutto prenderci un bel caffè. Now, there are many types of cafe in Italy, many types of coffee. So it's very important that we learn how to order them properly. Ambra, when we go into a bar, what is the first thing that we should say? Prima di tutto, buongiorno. Buongiorno. And then once we've decided what we would like, how should we say, I would like? Molto semplice, vorrei. She said it's very simple. How many R's are in that? Will you say it again, please? Okay, vorrei. Just a couple of R. We'll work on that. Ambra, if I would just like an espresso, uh -huh. what should I ask for? Entri nel bar e chiedi, buongiorno, vorrei un caffè. But what if I would like a little bit of foamed milk in my caffè? In questo caso dovresti chiedere un caffè macchiato. And what does macchiato mean? Poco poco di latte con la schiuma sopra. <laughs> <laughs> what if I would like a caffè with a lot more steamed milk? What I'm thinking of is a cappuccino. Ha, ah, questo è molto semplice. Ti basta chiedere un cappuccino. Just need to add the right Italian accent. Perfect. <laughs> okay, what if I would like to order a latte? Latte? Che te ne fai del latte? What, a latte? No. I want a latte. Latte, latte caldo o latte freddo? Che latte vuoi? <laughs> Ah, ma quindi tu vuoi il latte macchiato. Cioè, latte con un po' di caffè dentro. Allora è latte macchiato. Solo latte? No, no non ha senso, non esiste. Finally, well, what if I don't want just a little dinky coffee? What if I want a proper cup of American coffee? How do I ask for that? Ti basta chiedere un caffè americano. Però ricordatevi che per noi... Il caffè americano è un caffè, un espresso, al quale viene aggiunta l'acqua calda. You know, Ambra, sometimes an espresso just isn't enough for me, but I don't want a full caffè americano, as you just said. So what would I order instead? Puoi sempre chiedere per un caffè lungo, che è come un espresso, quindi concentrato, però un pochettino più lungo, ma non tanto come l'americano. Una via di mezzo. Right, now let's put what we've learned in action. I'm going to be the bartender and Ambra will be the client. Buongiorno. Buongiorno a lei. Vorrei un caffè e un caffè macchiato, per favore. Subito. Ecco il caffè. Ah, oh, grazie. Ecco il caffè macchiato. Grazie mille. Prego. Buono. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Oh, ma non mi ha parlato. She didn't pay me. <laughs> Thank you, Ambra, for teaching us the different types of coffee, and we hope that you'll be here soon to try out your newfound knowledge of Italiano. Ci vediamo molto presto su... Essential. Italiano. Ciao. Ciao.
All right, so that was essential Italiano, and it's more than the language. It was the gestures, it was the sort of animation, and it was the cultural understanding of how do you order a coffee? We just say a coffee, but there's so many kinds when you go into a bar in Italy, isn't there? Exactly, and it's very important to get the right kind. And like anywhere you go, if you just make an attempt to speak the language, you really will ingratiate yourselves so much more with the locals. And of course, you get a better experience out of that as well. So, And you could go around on your whole trip saying, I want some milk, and they would get around to giving you some coffee, but you might as well get on the ball and realize you don't ask for a latte. <laughs> and uh, if you really want one, I guess. But. I guess you could. It's an option. <laughs> but for me, I don't need to know all those things. I just need to know that these exist. And what is my favorite? I like the cafe macchiato. So that I feel quite smart when I go to a bar and I ask for a cafe macchiato. Perfecto. Was, How do you say I would like, Rick? Do you remember? Oh, vorrei. Oh, and he's got the R's. <laughs> Bravissimo. Vorrei un cafe macchiato, por favore. Subito, signore. Subito. Mille grazie. Ciao. <laughs> Prego. Oh, he didn't pay me either. Ah, that's right. Hey, um, I just, when I, when I was watching that, it, it occurred to me, these are the lessons that you and all of our guides give on a Rick Steves bus tour. We love yes. to give these kind of basic survival tips. They are cultural, they are language, and they make your travels go better. You make more friends, you get more smiles, you bit, get better service, you have a better experience. You don't need to be brilliant linguist to do this. I'm certainly not, but I learned the key words like that and it makes a big difference. Hey, Anna, I have had my aperitivo now. I have had my, my spritz with my potato chips. I'm gonna put the potato chips away. I'm gonna keep drinking my aperitivo. Uh, it is very refreshing. <laughs> and I'm gonna start eating my props now. So I'm gonna start eating my insalata caprese. Mm -hmm. Bonissimo. Bene. And I'm going to also dig into my bruschetta. Now, bruschetta is what I know, but of course, if you change the last letter to an I, you get plural, right? Bruschetti? Nope. That, that word does not exist. It's bruschette because it's feminine. Oh, bruschette. <laughs> bruschette. Mm -hmm. oh my Una God. bruschetta, due bruschette. Va bene. Due bruschette. Okay, I got tre bruschette, and I'm going to be munching on that as we go to Siena. So oh, thank you welcome. again for joining us. It is, what is it, like three o'clock in the morning for you right now? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned that, but you are doing great. Thank you for interrupting your night to be with all of us here on Monday Night Travel. Now, let's go to Anna's hometown, or her adopted hometown, of Siena. Italy packs 55 million people into an area about the size of Arizona. Between Florence and Rome is the region of Tuscany. We start in Siena, explore the Chianti region, and then visit wineries near Montepulciano and Montalcino. Back in the 1300s, Siena was a major banking, trading, and military power. It was in a league with Venice, Florence, and Genoa. It had a population of about 50,000 people. That was one of the biggest cities in Europe, about as big as Paris. But after being weakened by a devastating plague and conquered by its bitter rival Florence, it's been a backwater ever since. Siena's loss became our sightseeing gain as its political and economic stagnation preserved its purely Gothic identity. Its population hasn't changed for centuries. It's still around 50,000. And I do want to remind you that Siena has a very strong and um, sort of edgy, I mean, just aggressive rivalry with Florence. And it goes back centuries. And when you think about how Siena has, you know, Florence has become grander over the years and Siena is a little bit of a backwater. It is a blessing for us travelers and people who love history and art to find these places that are kind of mothballed because of historic disasters. I was thinking of the places that are remarkably preserved in Europe for bad news centuries ago. You've got the Cotswold villages, they lost their wool trade and they became just uh, once rich, then poor, and then rediscovered and rich again because of tourism. Rotenburg on der Tauber, once a really rich town, it got blown away in the Thirty Years' War, and it just was a, um, uh, discarded by history, and today it's rediscovered in romantic times and appreciated. Toledo, the historic capital of Spain, wrapped around the tight bend in its river, perfect uh, fortifications in middle, medieval times, but when you needed a bigger city that could grow, it couldn't grow beyond its natural fortifications of that hairpin turn in the river, so Madrid became big and Toledo got stuck in the past, 
I think the hill towns all over Italy were put on hilltops for defensive purposes, but that kind of kept them away from prosperity later on when you normally needed that, when you formerly needed that, uh, that hilltop location. And we just talked about Siena. So there's plenty of ways that uh, we can be kind of take advantage of uh, historical misfortune to enjoy towns that are amazingly well-preserved. Uh, Anna, I mentioned the rivalry with Florence. Um, it's amazing how that survives to this day. You feel it on the, on the soccer field. Uh, you feel it when tourists go to different towns. Tell us about that. I may have told you this before, but the first time I came, when I slept up there and uh, I went to go see the head and thumb of St. Catherine up in San Domenico, it's right by the soccer stadium. And there was chanting going on. And at the time my Italian wasn't very good, but I asked a woman passing by, oh, what's going on? And she said, that's the soccer stadium. Who is playing? Siena is playing Florence because we were in the top series for about five minutes. And I said, what are they chanting? And she said, Hmm. The Sienese are chanting to the Florentines, Ricordate Montaperti. Remember the Battle of Montaperti that we won against you, Stinky Florence, in the year 1260. 1260. 1260. 800 years ago. Get over it. Sienna, get over it. No, never. No, you still <laughs> feel it. You still feel it. Sienna's great central piazza is Il Campo. Like a people-friendly stage set, it's the heart of Siena, both geographically and metaphorically. The historic junction of Siena's various neighborhoods, or Contrada, it fans out from City Hall as if to create an amphitheater. The square and its buildings are the color of the soil here, a color known to artists and Crayola users as burnt Siena. Sprawling before the city hall backdrop, the gently tilted piazza offers the perfect invitation to loiter. This is a major university town, and a mix of students, locals, and tourists lounge comfortably, as if it's their community living room. The great sites of Siena date from long before the country of Italy existed, and these sites have a consistent theme. The Republic of Siena is independent and perfectly capable of ruling itself. The Mangia Tower, built nearly 700 years ago, remains one of Italy's tallest secular towers. Medieval Siena was a self-assured republic, and this tower stands like an exclamation point, an architectural declaration of independence from both the Pope and the Emperor. 300 winding steps take you high above the town. Your reward? A bird's eye view down at the uniquely shaped square and a commanding view of the Tuscan countryside. Beneath the tower, the city hall is open to visitors. Its historic rooms were for centuries the home of Siena's government. And by the way, this is the room that we were just in with, with Anna a few minutes ago, and now we get a second look at it. Check out this beautiful art from the Middle Ages. This is before the Renaissance. In the Room of Peace, the Republic's Council met under instructive 14th century propaganda, showing the effects of good and bad government, with a message that seems remarkably applicable today. Bad government, a dictatorship counseled by greed and tyranny, results in a place you wouldn't want to call home, with rundown buildings and violence in the streets. But good government, with wise and virtuous leadership, results in a utopian republic where the shopping's brisk, <coughs> construction's booming, students are attentive, and women dance freely in the streets. The message? A community ruled by a just government enjoys peace, prosperity, and is a great place to raise your kids. For a portrayal of that good government in action, drop by the historic hospital of Santa Maria della Scala. So I just gotta say, it's so fun to let art be a time tunnel experience for you. Here we are in Siena looking at art to find out how people lived 600 years ago. A series of idealized frescoes shows medieval Siena's innovative healthcare and progressive social welfare system at work. The city, rather than the church, ran this hospital, illustrating how far secular society had come in Siena by the 1400s. It took in and raised orphans, from wet nurse, through schooling, to a civil wedding. 
and this wedding is not arranged. It's based on love. Sienese society cared for its poor. Bread was given to the needy. Note the loaves are cleverly stamped to prevent resale. The hospital was run by secular doctors and nurses. In a slap to church authorities, this well-fed monk looks bored as he seems to ignore a dying patient's confession. Siena is a stony wonderland where people rather than cars fill the streets. It's that time in the early evening when friends gather and stroll. Like in any Italian city, the people of Siena are out and making the scene. This ritual is called the passeggiata. It's like cruising without cars. In fact, throughout the Mediterranean region, early evening is the time to be out and about. So, Anna, the passeggiata is something that is so integral to the love of life in Italy. We're going to be joined by Roberto Becchi, another great guide in Siena in a moment. Before we meet Roberto, tell me, what is, what is the passeggiata to you? How do you define it? And, and what's your ritual for enjoying it? Well, the passeggiata is when you go out to, to see people and to be seen. And sometimes you do kind of laps, you know, as you do in the swimming pool. You go up and down and up and down until you see or you are seen by who you want to be seen by. And it's just a nice way to kind of, again, get rid of the day, get ready to go for your aperitivo, meet up with friends um, and get some exercise. And that is something that we do every night. If you're in a hurry, you have to go off the main drag, which is what we're on right now in this yeah. video on the Corso. If you need to be somewhere in a hurry, then you go on the side streets. But usually everyone goes on the main street. So, so. if you're trucking along, if you're going to get somewhere, you go on a parallel little lane. But it, most people are out and about to see their neighbors. And <laughs> I, I just, I, I miss that. When I get home, I walk out in the streets and I go, Do, does Where anybody is everybody? Live here? Where is everybody? But when you're in Italy, <laughs> Every yeah. evening, you've got this amazing passeggiata. Here we go. The passeggiata is ideal for getting together with friends. And I'm joined by my friend and fellow tour guide, Roberto Becchi. With Roberto, my passeggiata includes a little history. I just feel there's so much history all around. Yes, especially on this road here. What happened on this road? This road in the Middle Ages was called Via Francigena. The way of the French. Yes, is where all the pilgrims were passing through, from France to Rome. This is the pilgrim's route. Yes. For centuries. And people are walking to this very day. But yeah, now, but they do passeggiata. Passeggiata today. Oh, I love the passeggiata. All the Italians love the passeggiata. Everybody's out, every generation. Every huh? generation going up and down on the main road, shopping, looking at the last fashion. What are the fashions? Who's got a new baby? Absolutely. <laughs> Italy is a culture of piazzas. Ever since Roman times, the piazza has been the heartbeat of the community. And in Siena, Il Campo is perfect for a nice aperitivo. We've grabbed a front row table to enjoy a spritz. That's a favorite drink, mixing Aperol, white wine, and fizzy water. I love the aperitivo. Aperitivo is Italian for happy hour, basically get a cocktail and you know it's not a cheap cocktail but it comes with lots of nice munchies and the best view in town yes in the main square of Siena oh oh I absolutely love it Anna can you relate can you can you well that's right down the street from you could go there tomorrow morning ah. no, up the street up, up the street <laughs> <laughs> that's right it's a hill town and it's not on the crest of the hill Exactly. Now, the Campo is, it's actually the convergence of the three uh, hills of Siena, because Campo means field, and it used to be a field. We're not very creative here sometimes, but it is the social heart of the city. It's the political heart of the city. And like the Romans had their special areas for games, we too use that space for games. So now, I think it's important when you're going to sit for half an hour after a busy day of sightseeing, Go to the best square. I mean, it might cost you two dollars more for your your spritz. I don't think it will. It's just it's about the same price everywhere. It's like four or five euros. You got yourself yeah. a nice drink. And if you'll notice what Roberto and I were doing, we're sitting in the best square in town. We've got the apparat. You get the little munchies, and this can be a buffet these days because they're very competitive. They want to get some business in before dinner, and you buy your spritz, and that includes access to the buffet. 
Exactly. Sometimes we choose our aperitivo based on how much we want to eat, because sometimes, you know, you might not want a big meal. So you go to the place that serves the best spread yeah. <laughs> or where your friend is working so that he or she will give you extra prosciutto. Uh, oh, that's some advantage I wouldn't have. Now, this aperitivo tradition, some people mm -hmm. nickname aperitina, meaning the uh, cutting ap aperitivo back with the uh, with the dinner, which is the word is chena, not very stylish to do that. But if you just want a couple of little open face sandwiches, you could call it dinner. It started in Milano in the north, didn't it? Yes, it's a northern thing. And I, I lived for I lived in Turin my first time I lived in Italy all those years ago. And in Torino, mm -hmm. I mean, they would have mini app, like mini appetizers and mini primi and mini secondi and mini dolci so you had you did have your whole oh. apericena it was fantastic for someone on a budget as i was at the time I love it hey anna thank you so much for joining us and i want to just take a moment to thank our team at monday night travel gabe is working with us right now as the moderator uh julianne is behind the scenes answering your questions and so on and we've also got Lisa with us and Ben, our friend Ben is in Russia right now studying, but we could not do Monday night travel every Monday without our wonderful team. I do wanna remind you, you can see all sorts of our TV shows without these pauses and discussion anytime you want. If you go to ricksteves.com, go into the TV section, just click. You got a whole half hour on Siena. You got a whole nother half hour on Tuscany. I also wanna remind you that we will be going to Q and A after the video and that's coming up in just a few minutes. So if you have any questions, put it into the Q&A and then Gabe will field that and we'll get some uh, information as you like out of uh, Anna. And remember, there are links in the chat section. The most important link is the link to Anna's website. And she does a lot of these videos that she's made with her sidekick, Umbra. And Anna is working with us on our tours and she does her own city tours and local tours. Anna, when you are doing tours on a Rick Steves tour, what, what uh, itineraries do you do? So generally, I do the uh, heart of Italy in nine days, uh, Venice, Florence, Rome in 10 days, and the village Italy in 14 days, which makes a stop in Siena for the afternoon. <laughs> that must be fun. For you. Um, that uh, kind of an, a little bonus for people on your bus that get to go to Siena on yes. the village Italy tour. I took my family on the village Italy tour because I wanted to go to places that were not the big famous sites. And it was yeah. so intimate. It was so into the artisans and the love of the land and the heritage and the cuisine. And that's our village Italy tour. I think our most action packed tour of all 40 tours that we offer all over Europe is Venice, Florence, Rome. I mean, imagine those three great cities, about three days in each city in 10 days. Wow. And then the Heart of Italy tour is an amazing tour. I wish everybody had three weeks for their vacation. Some people have only a week and a half. And I actually took the Heart of Italy tour. I led it along with Ben um, just a couple of months ago as we gave our new guides a sort of a chance to be tour members on a, on a bus that I was leading so they could learn what is the Rick Steve style of travel. And I enjoyed every minute of that Heart of Italy tour. So you can learn more about that uh, in our website. Again, you can go to, you can hit the link and go to Anna's website to learn more about what she does. And we're going to be answering questions in just a few minutes. But right now, we need to carry on with our look at Siena. What an amazing town. Look at those beautiful spritz and the potato chips right there. Bon appetito. Oh, green olives. I missed my green olives. I love it. Siena's 13th century Gothic cathedral with its striped tower is dedicated to the Virgin Mary and covered with art. The richly ornamented facade bristles with ornamentation. Its striking mosaics framed by patriarchs and prophets, saints and gargoyles. Grand as Siena's cathedral is, it's actually the unfinished rump of a failed vision after nearby Florence began building its huge cathedral, proud Siena, not to be outdone by its rival, planned to build an even bigger church. So here's this Siena Florence thing that Anna and I were talking about. And as a TV producer and a script writer, it was really a challenge to film this, to block it out, to write the script so that people could get their brains around this big cathedral that was designed to be three times as big, teetering on the top of the hill which is Siena. So see if you can follow this. I did my best to explain it. In fact, the biggest church in all of Christendom. But Siena was so hilly, there wasn't enough flat ground to support such an enormous church. What to do? Build the oversized church anyway, 
and prop up the overhanging edge by building the baptistry underneath. The cathedral we see today was intended only to be a transept or wing off the envisioned nave or main part of the church. These towering marble arches hint at the immensity of the vision. But the arches were as far as Siena got before construction problems and a devastating plague scuttled the project. I'm standing atop what would have been the front of that church. Had it been completed, this square would have been not a parking lot, but the nave itself. It's fun to imagine that if Siena's grandiose plans had succeeded, I'd be looking straight down the nave of that massive church toward the altar. The resulting church is still impressive. It's richly decorated from top to bottom. I gotta remind you, you're gonna see this pristine, tranquil, worshipful space mobbed with everybody in town packing in there after the palio because they come here to get their award. And uh, just keep that in mind. It's a beautiful cathedral that also serves as the gathering place for the city when it's having its grand palio fiesta. Peering down from above are 172 heads. They represent the popes who reigned from the time of St. Peter to the 12th century. The exquisite marble floor is paved with Bible scenes, intricate patterns, and allegories. This one represents Sienna as a she-wolf at the center of the Italian universe, orbited by such lesser lights as Rome, Florence, and Pisa. The greatest artists of the day helped decorate Sienna's cathedral. In this side chapel, St. John the Baptist, carved by Donatello, wears his iconic rags. And high above, playful cherubs dangle their feet. This memorial to the Sienese Pope Pius II features a statue of St. Paul carved by Michelangelo himself. And in another chapel, you'll see why Lorenzo Bernini is considered the greatest Baroque sculptor. His St. Catherine is in spiritual ecstasy. We'll pause there just for Anna. St. Catherine, oh. And St. Jerome caresses the crucifix like a violinist lost in heavenly music. Look at that, like a violinist lost in heavenly music. Anna, there's so much beautiful art in Siena. What, what is your favorite art? What, what is your favorite art experience in the city? Uh, I didn't know there'd be such hard questions. Um. <laughs> Have another sip of your uh, spritz. Yeah, seriously. Mm. Well, I guess with anything, it, it kind of depends on your mood and where you are. And even how many people are there, you know, with you experiencing that or if you're on your own. Um, but the cathedral never ceases to amaze because you have this space that, yes, isn't as big as Florence's, that's fine. But we have works by Michelangelo, Donatello, the young Raphael with Pinturicchio, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, all in their original places, this magnificent floor, which I defy you to go in there and not see something new every single time. Okay, and just, oh. can, can I just butt in here out of, out of to, to pile on with Florence? When mm -hmm. I go to Florence, I don't even go inside the cathedral. There's not much in there, frankly. Um, I'm, maybe somebody could disagree, but rel in relative terms. But yeah. I will never go to Siena, no matter how, how many times I've been there, without going into the cathedral. And you mentioned it. It's got that variety of masterpieces by, by, the, by the greatest artists of, of Italian art history. And it is in situ. In situ. There's a word, a little phrase to impress your friends. Uh, rather than hanging in a museum, it's where the artist was paid to put it. It's designed for that space. It's the way to see and appreciate great art to find it in situ. And here you got the works of, as, as, as Anna said, Michelangelo, Bernini, so many great artists, sculptors, painters right there in that, and, and the mosaic floor. Ah, a highlight is the church's Piccolomini Library. And the Piccolomini Library. Brilliantly frescoed, it captures the exuberance and optimistic spirit of the 1400s. This, somebody told me this has not even been restored, that this is original. Is that your understanding? Yep, it, it was made from about 1502 to 7, and it has not been restored because it was never in used age of, as a chapel. 
Wow. Humanism, when the Renaissance was born. The frescoes look nearly as vivid now as the day they were finished over 500 years ago. They celebrate the life of one of Siena's hometown boys who became Pope Pius II. Each of the scenes is framed with an arch, as if opening a window into the real world. Mm. Mm. Bravo. The back streets of Siena have changed little since the days of the Renaissance. Make a point to get away from the crowds and enjoy a quiet moment with the timeless magic of Siena. All over town, shops tempt you with edible Sienese specialties. Gourmet pasta, vintage Chianti, wild boar prosciutto. This looks very good. It's tutti uh, Toscana? Tutti prodotti di Siena. Siena. And a delicious Sienese salami. Assaggio. This is salami. Yeah. Assaggio della casa. Si chiama finocchiona. Un salami mm. fatto con il finocchietto selvatico. Complimenti. Siena's claim to caloric fame is panforte, a chewy local delicacy that tempts even fruitcake haters. <laughs> okay, Anna, you've got some desserts. Let's just take this moment for you to share with us because I'm, I'm ready for dessert, okay? We've had our aperitivo, we've had our bruschetto and our salad. Let's have this. What if there's a, I weighed it. This is a half a kilo of pan forte, which means strong bread. And it's not the pan pepato because I was feeling pan, I was feeling margarita today. I'm wearing a daisy. Margarita means daisy. It's more delicate, like for the queen of Italy, right? Um, but you can see that there are lots of dried fruits and almonds in there, and it's all kind of sealed. It's all, what's the word? Bound together with honey. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's been made in Siena for over 800 years, given to travelers on their way to Rome along that Via Francigena that you and Roberto were talking about earlier. You know, when I was a kid, I dreaded holiday time because I my grandma had this fruit cake and I had to eat it and it was just horrible. Oh, but I love the pan forte. That's oh, if you've yeah. not liked Ooh. fruit cake, check out the pan forte. It's got that nice little dusting of powdered sugar. I just spilt all over my desk, but yeah. <laughs> And also these, do you know what these are? Uh, Ricciarelli or something like that? Exacto, made with, these are good for gluten-free people too because they are made with almond flour. And again, these have been made since at least the 13th century. So take a part in local tradition. Will you take a little bite of that Ricciarelli? I just want to imagine how it tastes. Mm. <laughs> oh, I want to, so, oh. When you order your cafe here in Siena, you know how to order your café. Vorrei un café macchiato in your case. Sí. E un ricciarello. Certo. Perfecto. Okay. Well, let's go back to our trip through Siena. Tasty Siena. Mm -mm -mm. Siena offers a delicious range of opportunities to enjoy the hearty Tuscan cuisine. Characteristic tavernas serve local dishes in a grotto chic atmosphere. This one under a fine old medieval vault. I gotta say one of my favorite things to do in all of Europe is work on this book. And when I'm in Siena to partner with Anna or Roberto or one of my other friends who are guides and we just list all the restaurants in a row and we just blitz that place, drop into every one of them, check them out and make sure our listings are really good. It's so much fun, especially in Italy to find these restaurants. I love bruschetta. And my favorite is without toppings, just the olive oil and garlic. I like it, it's simple because you can taste the oil. The olive oil. You can use your hands here. You can use your hands. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's nice. Like I've ordered my pasta, beets. That gives me half portions of two different pastas for the cost of one, mm. doubling my taste treat. Oh. Looks like some nice white truffles there. Yeah. <laughs> That's light and nice with the truffle. I like yes, that. Yes, absolutely. It's a good match. Wow, tell me the story. And we cap our meal by descending into their ancient Etruscan wine cellar. Dating from 300 BC and roughly hewn by hand, this former tomb now houses the taverna's fine wine and cheese. Year around, it's the perfect temperature for wine and the perfect humidity for cheese. And as a travel writer, I feel it's my solemn duty to confirm this. It's nice. Perfect. I bet the Etruscans liked this. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Look at that scene, that exquisite cheese. I'm, I'm holding, I'm sure I'm holding a beautiful glass of wine there. And it's, and I'm in an Etruscan cellar. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, now, Anna, we are going to, it's going to be paleo now for a little bit. And, and I, I think before we get there, we'll talk more with you about the paleo, but we should properly uh, attire ourselves, wouldn't you say? I think so. I think so. <laughs> I got to shush it. Yeah, zhuzh it, zhuzh it. There you go. There you go. Make sure you can see all my colors here. Yes, that's good. And I am not from your con contrada. But how that's many, okay. How many neighborhoods are there in, in Siena? Bicha Fette, 17. 17. And how many compete in the Palio twice a year? Just 10 for safety reasons. Ah, <laughs> so there's some kind of a drawing where they decide which 10 compete. And then everybody's sporting their. And can you, at a glance, do you know what, at a glance, do you know what neighborhood this is from? Absolutely, Drago. Facile. <laughs> dragon? Is that what that means? Yes, Drago, so, Dragon. I had no idea what I was buying. I just needed something colorful to wear. And I'm, now I'm an honorary member of the, dra the Dragon neighborhood. Va bene, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll allow it this time. <laughs> I, I'm, I have an excuse. I, I, was, I didn't know what I was doing. Forgive me. Forgive me. That's, no, we like Dragon. Dragon is where San Domenico is. So Catherine's head and thumb are in Dragon territory, but she oh, is from you. the goose. But I am from the Lupa. And what does Lupa mean? The she-wolf, which we've already seen, is one of the symbols of Siena and Rome and the best colors, black, white, and orange. Okay, so we are now wearing our appropriate colors and let's get into the paleo season. Across Europe, festival traditions go back centuries and are filled with time-honored pageantry and ritual. Entire communities hurl themselves with abandon into the craziness. There's no better example than here in Italy, Siena's Palio. Twice a year, that spirit shows itself in a five-century-old citywide competition that culminates in a crazy horse race. Siena is divided into 17 neighborhoods, or contrade. With their mascots and flags, these have long been competitive and filled with rivalry. Each July and each August, the entire city readies itself for the big race. Its centerpiece, Il Campo, is transformed into a medieval racetrack as tons of clay are packed atop the cobbles and bleachers are set up. Before the race, competing neighborhoods gather for communal dinners that last well into the night. There are rousing choruses with everybody cheering their contrada. For days, processions break out across the city. With waving flags and pounding drums, it all harkens back to the Middle Ages, when these rituals boosted morale before battle. A highlight of the parade is the actual banner, or palio. This palio, featuring the Virgin Mary to whom the race is dedicated, will be awarded to the victorious Contrada. Finally, with what seems like the entire city packed into Il Campo, it's race time. Bleachers and balcony seats are expensive, but it's free to join the masses in the middle. The snorting horses and their nervous riders line up, jockeying for the best spot. Silence takes over. Once the rope drops, there's one basic rule. There are no rules. They race bareback like crazy while spectators go wild. Life stops for these frantic three laps, just 90 seconds. When the winner crosses the line, the winning contrada goes berserk. Tears of joy flow, people embrace. The winners thunder through the streets and eventually into the cathedral, filled with jubilation. Then the winners raise their coveted palio high, champions, until the next race. Oh boy. Hey, well, we've been having so much fun talking that we're running a little late, but I've got to show you these little clips here. So um, I'm going to just go right through them. And they're just five or six minutes of clips from the Palio. And then we'll talk more with Anna about what each of them meant. Here we go. Okay. 
No. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, and I'm in Siena, but one mile outside of town, at a beautiful bed and breakfast called Francis Lodge. And the great thing about Siena is this culture is alive and well. It's the home of the Palio, and Francis is going to demonstrate the historic flags and how this was a language for the military. Exactly. So they move the, the flag, just like a name, eh, to show to the army to move. When they like to stop the army, they round the flag around the body. For the attack, they round the flag over the head, this way, and this is for the attack. Bravo! <laughs> Bravo! And what contrada are you with? This is my, is the tower with the elephant. And what is, is the name the of that? Tower. The tower contrada. The only contrada who has two rivals. Yeah. One by Boda, no recognize. <laughs> the other is uh, the historical enemy, we don't know the date. What is the best contrada? This one. The tower. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ciao, grazie. And Francis runs a great little B&B, a fancy B&B outside of town, just a short ride out of town called Francis Lodge. When it's been in my book for, I think, 20 years now. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, and I'm in Siena. This is Palio time. It's several days of just community mayhem in a beautiful way. I'm uh, wearing the the banner of the dragon, <laughs> the dragons. I think there's 17 different neighborhoods. They're called Contrade. And this is the dragon Contrade here. And they're all out and about. The kids are having a good time. It's the community coming together. And I was just thinking, you know, in the United States, we have a lot of great festivals. But um, what I really like about Europe's festivals, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they have more comfortable, multi-generational. The kids... The adults, the grannies, the young singles, plenty of alcohol, you know, you got your beer and you got your wine, right in front of the kids. And uh, this is a community coming together. And this goes way, way back centuries. And right now we are just really, really immersed in a wonderful example of community in Europe. And, and we're in Siena, about two hours north of Rome. And when we look out and see this magnificent city and the beautiful moon, I think we know this is a delightful place to travel. Happy Palio from Siena. And the big horse race is the day after tomorrow. So this is out my window from my hotel and they're setting up for the big dinner for this neighborhood. And it's all nicely prepared. And then when they have their big bash, Whoa, right outside the window in my hotel. And then the next day, it's gone. And they do this twice a year. I'm with Steve, and I'm out late at night in Siena. It's the night before the Palio. And all 17 neighborhoods are out dining, singing, drinking, and being convivial. district and if you look up here I don't know what's up here but you can see <laughs> there's lots going on happy travels and now we have a special vantage point from a friend of Roberto's they if you have friends that have an apartment overlooking the campo Everybody wants to be in touch with you, baby. And we're here in a beautiful spot to watch and just feel the energy here as we enjoy the Palio. Wow. I'm Rick Steves, and I'm with my friend Franco. And Franco lives this campus, a beautiful place to enjoy the Palio. And uh, 
It's just, this is so nice to have a friend to give us this thing. Franco, grazie. Ciao. So we've got our special little spot, and it's right here. And uh, this is our private little booth. And I'll tell you, when you have friends like Roberto and Franco, you get to be able to enjoy the view from up here. Excuse me, man. And for like an hour, everybody's packing in. And you can see way over there on the left, that's the one entrance into El Campo. And they just keep packing the people in. You gotta get in touch with your inner sardine. And, and there's like, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people are gonna enjoy this thing, but every conceivable balcony, every window is packed. This happens twice a year. It's happened for 500 years. And we happen to be right above the starting point. And right now you can see the man right below us there. And he's got exactly how you do this. He's looking at his scrapbook. And that scrapbook probably goes back in different iterations for 500 years. And are they doing it right? Well, I hope so. Because there's a lot of tradition and it's very, very strict. But in about an hour, they will have this place as packed as possible. Every one of the 10 contrade that are competing will be lined up here with their horses. And then they go around this track three times and somebody is going to win and that contrade is going to go crazy all night long. And we're just kind of hoping it's not the Panther because that's where our hotel is. And if the Panther wins, we're going to get no sleep tonight. But this is the Palio and the uh, dignitaries are going to be right there. There's plenty of security, there's plenty of emergency health people, there's plenty of tradition, and this is the proud city of Siena. And the travels from the Palio. Okay, so now, Anna, we were up there watching this, and this the year we were there, your Contrada won, right? Lupa. Now, we've got <laughs> yes we did no big deal we we've, we've um, got uh, i've got a one minute clip coming up that shows the pandemonium in the streets as we go to the cathedral but i remember seeing you off and on the days leading up to this and i don't think you had one for decades and then you won two in the same year we did <laughs> we won in july and then we won in august i'm getting nervous i know exactly what's going to happen i know exactly what happened but we won both, only the 17th time in history that's happened, our second time, the last time was 1785. And then in 2016, we hadn't won in 27 years. So the euphoria of going from the grandmother, quote unquote, the closest to death, to the newborn winning Contrada twice. Okay, so let's do that. And I, I'll never forget that joy <laughs> that you and your neighbors felt. So here we are, Lupa, the she-wolf has just won, yeah! <laughs> Lupa won, and that Contrada is going crazy. So I'm just being a human shield for my cameraman. So I'm standing there <laughs> bracing him and everybody has to go around me so he can get a shot. I didn't win, but Lupa did. I'm blocking Simon, it's a human river. I'm multitasking. I'm doing a Facebook video and I'm blocking for Simon. Simon's getting... So it's pandemonium here. Okay. Meanwhile, Carl, our other photographer, has run to cathedral. He's stationed himself in the cathedral to see all of the craziness coming in to get that banner from the cathedral. We got enough. See a people. We got enough. All right, gonna we're going to head up to the cathedral right now. That's inside the cathedral right now. And that's the jockey.
that one for Lupa. <laughs> and, and, and Anna is patting her heart. Oh, my heart. Hey, um, I can hardly wait to get to questions. We've got some questions and let's go to Gabe and, and Gabe, it's time for questions. Um, we have more questions than I could ever ask the two of you, but before we embark on a few of them, can we have a word from our sponsor, Rick? Oh, yes, thank you. Very quickly, I do want to remind you, this event every Monday is brought to you by Rick Steves Europe. It's a gang of 100 happy travelers, me and Gabe and Julianne and 97 others. Plus, we've got 100 local guides, wonderful guides like Anna scattered all over Europe, and we are excited to welcome you back to travel. I've got my plane ticket. I just bought it last week. I'm heading off to Europe on March 18. I can hardly wait. We've got tours going next month and it's looking like we're gonna be able to do this. It's kind of exciting, it's exhilarating. None of us have a crystal ball, but we're hoping and praying that we can get back into the saddle. Uh, I do wanna remind you, if you want any more information, go to ricksteves.com. And when you go to ricksteves.com, you can click on our tours and then you can go to whatever tour you'd like. I like to click on the seats available uh, because it tells you what tours still have seats available. We've got 30,000 seats to sell. I think we're at about 27,000 seats. I gotta say, it's, it's not for everybody to be traveling this year, but we feel it's gonna be safe. We're not gonna do anything that is uh, risking people's health. I think we're gonna go with the normal sort of protocols in every country, but there's thousands of people enjoying Europe. And here's, I'll just click here on Venice, Florence, Rome. That's one of the tours that Anna leads. And if we look at Venice, Florence and Rome, we can see about the tour, look at dates and prices. And here you can see uh, there's a lot of different departures. Uh, most of the later dates are full with a wait list. Look at that, my goodness. But the earlier dates still have, they're filling fast or they're wide open. Uh, so there's a lot of seats open on certain tours and you can certainly check that out if you wanna see what's going on with our tour program. Also, I wanna remind you, we are having so much fun with Monday Night Travel. I'm so thankful for friends and fellow tour guides like Anna. And here, if you go to the homepage at ricksteves.com, tonight we're with Anna. Next week, we're celebrating Cameron's new book, The Temporary European. Cameron's amazing. The week after that, it's Valentine's Day. We're gonna do all sorts of romantic stuff in Europe. And then it's Paris with Steve Smith, the co-author of our The Best France book in print in the United States. After that, we meet Alfio down in Sicily. And then I'm going to do a special event just on Germany on March 7th. We've got lots of fun coming your way. And right now, I'm just so thankful that we are able to uh, celebrate our travels with all of you. And Gabe, let's have some questions for Anna. All right, Anna. So our first question, um, it's two questions together. Jackie wants to know, Polio aside, if maybe you don't want to be there during polio and get just kind of everyday Siena, what would be the best time of year to visit? And Blake also wants to know, I know you'd probably recommend spending as much time as possible in Siena, but for most travelers, what would be a good amount of time to spend in the city to, to really get the things that are of interest to most travelers? Well, I get that yeah, coming here for the July 2nd or the August 16th Palio can be very overwhelming because it's four days up into the race and then all the celebrations afterwards. So if you like to sleep, maybe it's not the best time to come. My favorite months are May and October. Uh, and we've actually had some really beautiful days now. I gave a few tours last week in sunny, sunny Siena and, you know, no crowds in January. So um, the weather is always a bit of a, you know, you never know, but May and October are fantastic. October might be the best month to travel. Um, and everyone who only comes for an afternoon or stays one night wishes they stayed for more. So I would say two nights is a really nice amount of time to spend here or seven years, like me. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere in between, perhaps. But definitely go for two nights because Siena, like Rick said, you know, there's the cars are not everywhere. You get to maybe even just having your same coffee at the same bar three or four times mm -hmm. gives you that community feel. And you can still visit a Contrada museum and learn about the Palio without all of the, the craziness that you just saw. And I got to say, from a guidebook point of view, there's plenty of good and affordable hotels in Siena. And it's so easy to get there from Florence. Everybody, so many people go as a day trip from Florence. It's doable if you don't want to spend the night there, but you're just going to be in the most crowded time. And if you can wake up early and have it to yourself, if you can be there after dinner, that's the magical time. Agreed. 
<laughs> now, Elizabeth wants to know, if you do want to be part of the madness and go during polio, do you have any words of advice for people that might want to undertake that? Yes. So first of all, find out who is running. So seven run by right, three will be drawn at the end of May. And then if you want to wear one of these, you can, but do not wear one if that contrada is not running because you're just targeting. <laughs> like, oh, Taurus. So now I find myself doing that. <laughs> uh, but you, we want to be temporary locals. And I would highly recommend that you get a guide for the day, you know, learn about the traditions, learn how to respect uh, the locals, because this is not just a festival that, you know, that's just done to get tourist money. This is part of the fabric of the Sienese culture. It is the greatest representation, celebration of civic pride that I have ever had the privilege of being a part of. You feel it, and so you must respect it. Mm -hmm. And you can certainly participate, uh, and, and then of course, go to the winning contrada and drink their wine afterwards, absolutely. Um, but hiring a guide, reading Rick's book, getting maybe a book called La Terra in Piazza, it's written in English, really gives you a background history and the Sienese respect those who respect that. And I really uh, would like to re reiterate Anna's point that it's not a touristic festival. It's not a cliche on stage. This is real. They, you know, they're, they're really, um, it goes back to the Middle Ages and it's alive and well, and they put up with the tourists, but they don't promote it to the tourists, that's for sure. Um, so speaking of, you talked about being temporary locals, but Anna, you've decided to become a permanent local in Siena. Um, we have Lori asking, why did you choose Siena? Um, and also Jill was just wondering, did you find the process of relocating to Italy from the US, was that a difficult process or not? Yes and no. I mean, making the decision was actually quite easy because I just, I missed it so much. I came here every summer to teach and going back every year to the States just got more difficult and more difficult. And so having the advantage of being, I used to be European until the 1st of January, but we won't talk about Brexit. Uh, I was able to move here as a European and then start that residency process. And I miss parts of the States like letters arriving on time and getting things done in a timely manner. Um, but that sense of community, the passeggiata, the good food, um, the contrada, I just felt home here. That bell tower, that's my campanile. It, it was calling me. <laughs> Ooh, I love that. Yeah. And we have one final question for tonight. It is from Patty. It's about Italy as a whole. Patty would like to know from each of you, what is your favorite Italian food experience that you've had? I know there's so many to choose from. You go first, Anna. Oh, I'm, uh, <laughs> I mean, anytime someone serves me something, I'm happy. I'm a really good eater. Uh, <laughs> but one of my absolute favorite experiences was when I was a college student all those years ago. That's what got the bug. And I was in two knee braces at a time, so you can imagine. But I wanted to go olive picking and I was in those trees with my knee braces and we came down and I had I ate everything and I was dubbed la manjona the big eater I'm like I've been working all day in the trees with knee braces I'm hungry <laughs> and we ate everything polenta and beef stew and red wine and then we had the olive oil that we had picked those olives we picked were pressed that very day and we tried it that very evening Oof. That's nice. Yeah. I and you can have those kind of experiences as a tourist. It's hard as a traveler, but you can have those experiences. I think one of my favorite things to do is to trust a rest, find a restaurant where you can really, that's family run, you know, and you got the, you, you meet the chef and the, the man and the woman of the house, you know, serve and cook. It's just all right there. And you trust them and you say, I want to spend 50 euros, bring me whatever you think would be the best. And you don't have to worry about ordering. You know you're going to get the fresh, the seasonal, the local. And you sit there and it just comes on and you got wine that matches it well. And it's just great. I'm not a sophisticated enough eater to know what pairs well. You know, you have different wines that pair with this or that. But I am sophisticated enough to recognize it when it does pair. And when you when I stumble onto that, it just it just bolsters my confidence. And you can take eating to a higher level. It's a beautiful beautiful thing and perhaps my best time eating would be at an agriturismo where you're sitting with the family and uh, you know when when the when the man or the woman of the house 
picks up their 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 bottle of wine and they pour it. This is just olive oil, <laughs> but it's got the name of the family right here, right there. It's the name of the family, and they've been making wine right here for generations. They pour it, and Grandma's over there. She doesn't get around that well anymore, but she's looking on, beaming with pride, as somebody from another hemisphere has ventured to their beautiful home, and they're being enjoying the fruit of that not of the labor, but of the heritage of that family, of generations of love and terroir, and to eat with the season and to eat everything growing right there in that community with a local family. It's, it's hard to put a price on that experience. It is. And Anna, you're shaking your head like, yeah, I know that. I get that. That's what you aspire to in your travels. Hey, Anna, I want to thank you so much for joining us. You are just such a delight. You're a treasure. I'm thankful you're one of our tour guides and I wish you all the best. I'm so glad you and your colleagues have survived this difficult darn pandemic. And we're gonna get back there and we're gonna be connecting. So to all of you, thank you for joining us today. And uh, if you're not making mistakes and laughing, you're not traveling right. I wanna finish up with a few bloopers here so we can all have a little fun. Uh, enjoying our travels and laughing at it. Entire communities hurl themselves with abandon into the craziness. Sure. And there's no better example. The European festival traditions go way back and are filled with... Now with that attitude, let's party. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time we're getting to know the locals, and that includes the pigeons. Seagulls. Seagulls. <laughs> This is Glasgow and Scottish Passions. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> All right, one more. Rob Roy's soul. Sporn. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, and I'm rolling. You like the hair? Yeah, yeah, hair's good. Good, me too. Your reward could be a quiet and shut up. According to legend. It's okay, there's a fairy right on your head, so no problem there. Oops. The Battle of Bannockburn. Falkirk. Falkirk. They say it produced 25% of the world's ocean-going ships. It's one being built right now. But after World War II... Buona notte, Anna. Buonanotte, Rick. Buonanotte a tutti. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Rick. Good night, Anna. Thank you for joining us, everyone. See you next week.